Most of us see corruption in our day-to-day -day lives. Greedy politicians on the news, police on the streets in their codes of silence, and professional quacks just trying to make a quick buck. Then to escape that reality, we hop onto the internet where we're drip-fed the latest information on how the Bezos and Musks of the world underpay and overwork their employees. Corruption is even pervasive in the music industry, perhaps now more than ever. But is it fair to say the whole industry is corrupt? Most likely not. But if one looks hard enough, they can find corruption anywhere. So that begs the question, what exactly is corruption? According to dictionary.com, corruption can be defined as the act of corrupting or state of being corrupt. Moral perversion, depravity, perversion of integrity, corrupt or dishonest proceedings, bribery, debasement or alteration as of language or text. Going a step further, the word corrupt can be used two different ways, as an adjective, guilty of dishonest practices, as bribery, lacking integrity, crooked, debasing character, depraved, perverted, wicked, evil, and as a verb, to destroy the integrity of cause to be dishonest, disloyal, especially by bribery, to lower morally, pervert. With these definitions, this paper will analyze several different aspects of the music industry. But before we can talk about the industry, we need to talk about how it began. Most people outside the industry would credit Thomas Edison as the forefather of modern music. They'd be right. After all, he did invent the phonograph, and he had a patent for 1,092 other inventions. But what most people outside the industry don't know is that he was not the first person to record sound. Approximately 20 years before Edison had his idea, French entrepreneur and inventor Edward Leon Scott de Martinville had created the phonograph. This device allowed a person to speak into a horn and have their words transcribed onto a lamp black coated paper. Granted, it recorded the waveforms of what was being said rather than the words themselves, but it was still a technological marvel. Thomas Alva Edison is the quintessential poster child of histories written by the winners. He stole the idea for the light bulb, motion picture, and sound recording. He promised Tesla $50,000 to fix the DC system, and when Tesla delivered AC to Edison, he only gave Tesla a raise. And once AC did start to catch on, he went on to film the electrocution of a live elephant to demonstrate the dangers of this new electricity. Of all the nasty stories about his actions, Topsy the Elephant was one of the most notorious. But what most people don't know is that he had almost nothing to do with it. Topsy was smuggled into the Four Paw Circus at a young age and was a loved part of the act until one morning when she killed circus worker J. Fueling Blount. Allegedly, the elephants in this circus loved having whiskey before breakfast, and he'd offered her an almost empty glass. In a rage, she picked him up with her trunk and threw him onto the ground. She was then traded between circuses until she ended up at Luna Park, where she was severely mistreated and abused. Her new handler, William Alt, had mistreated her so horribly he was arrested three separate times for his actions. After the third arrest, Topsy was left without a handler. That, coupled with her reputation of being a bad elephant, the park deemed the only sensible action was to execute the elephant. They fed her three cyanide-laced carrots, sent 6,600 volts of AC electricity through her body, then to make sure she was dead, they wrapped a rope around her neck and pulled for 10 minutes. So why is this event commonly tied to Edison? It may be partly due to that an action like this was not beyond him, as he was known to electrocute dogs, calves, and horses. This was in a successful endeavor to convince SPCA officials that electrocution was a more humane and efficient way of euthanizing animals than either drowning or hanging. Another part may be that the electricity used came from Edison Illuminating Company of Brooklyn, with which Edison was not involved. This information, coupled with much of the other notorious deeds he committed, shows that the forefounder of the industry was a corrupt individual, not as heinous as previously thought, but still corrupt nonetheless. But surely that doesn't trickle into the industry, right? The intention behind the phonograph wasn't solely to play music, but rather just the ability to record and play back sounds. Due to the eventual high demand of recorded music, this became the primary use for the device. Chichester Bell and Charles S. Tainter found it was better to record the songs on wax cylinders used for office transcriptions rather than the tinfoil Edison had been using, and Edison switched shortly after. The main issue with these cylinders was that they were only intended to be used one or two times and they were subsequently destroyed in the process. This resulted in different ways of mass producing these cylinders, 
such as making a master recording and making copies of it, and using multiple recording machines simultaneously in the studio. It wasn't until Emil Berliner came along in 1887 with the patent for the gramophone, the first device to utilize a disc for playback. Berliner invented one of the first types of microphones but was denied the patent in 1901 due to Edison preceded Berliner in the transmission of speech. This didn't stop Edison and others from taking the disc and implementing it into their own devices, marking the start of the music industry as we know it. By 1885, Willis Whitmark has started what later became known as Tin Pan Alley on 28th Street in Manhattan. Before the rules and regulations of copyright law, publishers were able to use and send out an oppositional publisher's works. Since there were little rights publishers had at that time and they quickly realized everyone was losing profits, many of them struck a deal to produce region-specific editions of songs. Publishing hubs such as Tin Pan Alley allowed these deals to be made in moments rather than sending correspondence through the mail. Several publishers banded together in 1895 under the Music Publishers Association of the United States, which provided the groundwork for performing rights organizations such as ASCAP in 1914 and BMI in 1939. This allowed entertainment music, rather than classical and non-secular, to flourish. Much of this new music had inspiration from early jazz, blues, and ragtime pieces. Edwin Armstrong began development of FM radio in 1923, which had a higher audio fidelity to AM radio. In 1935, it was ruled very high frequency waves would be reserved for TV, but with the help of the FM Broadcasters Association, Armstrong was able to reserve Channel 1 for radio. Once FM radios hit commercial success, RCA became known to use altered and pirated versions of his components for TV. In 1948, Armstrong sued RCA, which led to an extended legal battle, resulting in Armstrong losing his fortune of wealth and health. In 1954, he committed suicide by jumping out his 10-story window. After the Great Depression, radio became more accessible, threatening the record label's profits, resulting in them feeling a need to make up a loss. As a result, black bands were paid less than white bands and were placed in disadvantageous circuits if they were placed at all. Some labels were even known to pay their artists some booze. Then there were race records. Coined by Ralph Peer, this marketing technique separated black and white artists and put black artists at a disadvantage by only selling their records in select stores. It makes sense that it happened during a time where harmful ideologies were much more prevalent, but tragic nonetheless. Typically, these selected stores were around one in every 20, leaving artists with a much smaller audience. That is until Mammy Smith came around with the first blues record, Crazy Blues, which gave inspiration for many artists and paved the way for race records. Often, labels would have artists make cover versions of R&B and race records. These white cover versions were typically most detrimental to the black artists, composers, and performers that made the original version. One of the most notable instances is Pat Boone covering the Flamingo's I'll Be Home that went on to sell a million copies. He also covered Little Richard's Tutti Frutti, Elvis covered Big Mama Thornton's Hound Dog, and the Kingsman covered Richard Berry's Louie Louie. Another example is Bob Marley writing I Shot the Sheriff in 1973. In 1974, Eric Clapton covered the song and had his version inducted into the Grammy Hall of Fame in 2003. Every one of these instances, the white version sold more than the original black version. Usually, the black artists were getting nickel and dime by the labels and publishers, and it was only made worse when some hillbilly came along with a cover of their song and sold the recognition that came with it. However, this was great for labels and publishers, since they tended to own the copyrights to these songs, due to work for higher agreements and control over the market, they would receive royalties for every time a cover was played on the radio station. While they knew it would hurt the original artists, they saw it as a great opportunity to make money and reach wider audiences. By this time, the big six record labels, Warner Music, CBS, MCA, BMG, Capital EMI, and Polygram, had started their takeoff and takeover, meaning artists had very little control once they signed the dotted line. Fred Paris was paid $783 for writing In the Still of the Night, which garnered over $100,000 in royalties. Little Richard received $50 and a half a cent of every record sold for Tutti Frutti, which sold over 3 million copies. As he said in his biography, if you wanted to record, you signed on their terms, or you didn't record. On January 1st, 1941, radio broadcasters across the country would go on strike against the PRO ASCAP. This was due to the rapid increase of fees they were charging radio stations to play music from their catalog. In a matter of days, more than one million ASCAP tracks were pulled from the airwaves. 
BMI, a competitive PRO that offered better rates for the radio stations, offered a wide catalog of lesser known artists, but not enough to keep up with the demand radio stations had. To compensate, stations would play works from the public domain and foreign works. They would also play hillbilly and race records, both of which ASCAP deemed to be too low brow. This led to the popularization of race and hillbilly records, soon to be renamed Rhythm and Blues and Country and Western. Segregation and racism in the South led a mass migration of black people to the northern states during the 40s in opportunities for better jobs and better lives. The U.S. had also entered World War II, resulting in a shell egg shortage. At this point, labels only pressed records that they knew were going to sell, namely pop albums. This saw the rise of independent labels, including King, Peacock, Savoy, and Atlantic. R&B was viewed as a lucrative business, as many artists knew the only chance they had of getting signed was taking a one-time payment, rather than royalties. Despite the circumstances against these artists, many of their records sold. A contributor to this was the rise of national TV. As broadcasts became focused on a wider scope, radio became more local. By 1953, TVs were outselling radios, meaning that radios and records were less regulated by standards. Rolling into the 1950s with mild mannered pop and a strong conservative wave, rock and roll was the game changer the music industry needed. Music marketed during this time more prominently featured black artists, as much of the young white crowd had been previously exposed to R&B. During this time, record sales saw a shift of market from jukeboxes to private buyers and radio. A&R arranged tunes and paired artists with material, leaving groups in less control of what they performed. As technology became more advanced in the 60s and band members became more aware, the A&R role slowly transformed to producer and engineer. Elvis Presley started his career by being signed to Sun, soon after sold to RCA in 1955, thanks to his manager, Colonel Tom Parker. With his breakout song, Heartbreak Hotel, in 1956, he quickly became known for three things being the king of rock and roll, his fashion sense, and his provocative moves. While seemingly innocuous today, during the time his moves caused the public to outroar. The teens loved it, while the parents thought this would be the smut that corrupted their children. These antics would not only threaten Presley's upcoming TV appearances, but also got a judge to threaten him with jail time if he couldn't keep it together for his upcoming live show. After successfully reeling in his wild side, he was invited onto the Ed Sullivan show on three separate occasions. His last appearance had a camera angles that only shot him from the waist up, while his first two appearances featured quick close cuts of the singer to minimize the network's chances of broadcasting anything scandalous. His TV appearances would garner over 60 million viewers, smashing any previous record for years to come. In 1957, Presley was drafted into the U.S. Army, where he served in Germany for a year and a half. While serving, he met Priscilla Bolio and eventually married her on May 1st, 1967. Once returning from the war, Elvis branched out his career by delving into pop and film. By 1973, he was facing a growing weight problem and was deeply addicted to prescription medication. Matters were only made worse when he and Priscilla divorced later that year, all of which contributed to his death on August 6, 1977. Many labels failed to make a hit during the new wave Elvis had rushed in. They re-released works in the catalog from the 1920s, but it wasn't enough for modern audiences. During this time, rock and roll was simply white cover versions of R&B songs. Since the labels tended to own the publishing rights to songs rather than the songwriters, they heavily encouraged these covers as they generated large quantities of royalties. By the end of the 1950s, Tin Pan Alley, among many other labels, publishers, distributors, and entertainment personalities, had been accused of multiple payola scandals. Amendments to the Federal Communications Acts formally passed on September 13, 1960, that required radio stations to monitor suspicious activity and held program directors accountable when suspicions arose. After the payola had ended, rock had begun to stagnate and needed something to increase sales. Thanks to George, I did it again. Thanks to Sir George Martin and EMI, the Beatles were ready to be that something else. Consisting of John Lennon, Paul McCartney, George Harrison, and Ringo Starr, the Beatles changed everything. When they came to the U.S. in 1964, they blew everyone out of the water, even Elvis. Working under EMI's sister company Capital, they quickly accounted for half of the label's total sales. On February 9th, the band had their first U.S. public performance on The Ed Sullivan Show, with a total of 73 million viewers at home. Returning to England only three weeks after they'd arrived, 
they had done their job as Beatlemania had taken the country by storm. In March 1966, the Beatles were on an American tour when Maureen Cleave, a reporter and known friend of John Lennon, sat down in an interview with Lennon where he gave this quote. Christianity will go. It will vanish and shrink. I needn't argue about that. I'm right and I will be proved right. We're more popular than Jesus now. I don't know which will go first. Rock and roll or Christianity? Jesus was alright, but his disciples were thick and ordinary. It's them twisting it that ruins it for me. It took some time for this statement to be picked up by the public, but once it was, there was an outcry. Mothers became concerned that the Beatles were corrupting their children, and radio hosts deemed Lennon to be blasphemous, starting a Beatles boycott. It's even reported that the South Carolina Ku Klux Klan had their disdain for the band, nailing Beatles records to crosses before burning them. Manager Brian Epstein made statements to damper the fire, such as Lennon was simply saying that at the moment, the Beatles were more better known than Christ. It wasn't until August that Lennon hosted a press conference to apologize, where he said, I never meant it to be a lousy anti-religious thing. I apologize if that will make you happy. I still don't know quite what I've done. I've tried to tell you what I did do. But if you want me to apologize, if that will make you happy, then... Okay, I'm sorry. And surprisingly, it worked. While some various groups of protesters would greet the band in the southern leg of their tour, most everyone else took this apology to keep the Beatlemania going. Disapprovingly to audiences everywhere, this tour would mark the end of the Beatles doing consistent live performances, as shortly after they changed to mostly studio work. The juxtaposition of Presley and Lennon on their stances of war became part of their personal identities. Presley was able to meet President Richard Nixon in late 1970. This was in a successful effort to obtain a badge from the Federal Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs. He was under the impression that with this badge, and his other credentials, he would be able to go anywhere in the world while packing several kinds of heat. Presley was a proud-blooded American who had deep respect for Nixon and Lyndon B. Johnson, who had overseen much of the Vietnam War. Presley was also looked down on those who were anti-war. This struck a chord with Lennon, who viewed Presley as an idol, but vehemently opposed Johnson for raising the stakes in the war. One thing that truly set the Beatles apart from everyone else is that they were the first band to keep trying new ideas. Instead of being their horse into the ground, the band would continuously find new ways to reinvent themselves. Whether that was through different means of inspiration, songwriting process, instruments, style, playing and recording techniques. If it didn't detract from the band's artistic integrity, they were giving it a shot. The Beatles' success paved the way for future artists such as Swan, Bob Dylan, Paul Butterfield Blues Band, Janis Joplin, and The Grateful Dead. The youth culture that consumed this media could be classified as early counterculture, as they rejected the goal-oriented lifestyle of their parents and opted for communes and mind-altering drugs. From this, rock radio was born, which helped fuel the iconic Summer of Love. Before there was Woodstock or Altamont, there was Monterey Pop. Held in Monterey, California, this music festival was founded by Alan Pariser and Ben Shapiro. They went to John Phillips and Lou Adler to pitch a three-day music festival at Monterey Fairgrounds. Big names got involved with production, including Paul McCartney, Brian Epstein, Mick Jagger, Brian Wilson, among many others. This is also where artists such as Janis Joplin, Jimi Hendrix, and The Who were thrown into the American limelight. There were estimated to be around 200,000 attendees during the festival, and shortly after, the local mayor pushed a motion to outlaw gatherings of more than 2,000 people. While everyone had a good time and everything relatively went off without a hitch, without selling the film rights of the event to ABC, the event would have been a financial flop. That didn't stop others from doing their own festivals. Woodstock was originally founded by four people, Michael Lang, Artie Cornfield, John Roberts, and Joel Rosenman. A month prior to the event, the Wallkill Town officials passed a law that prohibited the festival within city limits, leaving them to find another spot. This spot was found with Max Yasger, a local dairy farmer with land to spare in Bethel, New York. While he received $50,000 for the use of the land, he was sued by a neighbor after the festival for $35,000 in damages done to the adjacent property. It'd be a fair assumption to say Yasger didn't do it for the money, evidential by the statement he made to the New York Times. If the generation gap is to be closed, the older people have to do more than we have done. 
While a monetary incentive never hurts, he was a firm believer of freedom of expression for everyone, even if the values differed from his own. It was estimated around 50,000 people would show up for the event. The actual turnout ranged around half a million. Roberts fronted $2.1 million of his own money to throw the festival. Even then, the expenses ended up almost doubling from what was expected, which led Roberts and Lang suing one another for damages. This may be in part due to Woodstock being a free event. People started showing up days before, while much of the stages, fences, ticket booths, and other amenities hadn't been built yet. On the topic of amenities, reportedly there was one toilet for every 833 people. That would mean for the crowd of 500,000, there were approximately 600 toilets. Another factor leading to higher expenses was the lack of security. The local police were banned from the event, leaving an estimated 12 people to run security across the whole venue. These 12 individuals consisted of members of the Hog Farm, the country's longest-running hippie commune. On top of that, there was mud everywhere, an abundance of drug-laced food and water, the Grateful Dead kept getting zapped during their set due to waterlogged instruments, at least 8 reported miscarriages, 1 drug overdose, and 17-year-old Raymond Mizak was run over by a waste disposal tractor. Many attendees and eventual viewers at home would consider the event a success, and for many it was, but there were many issues that prevented it from being a financial success. Once again, the big money came from selling the TV and movie rights once the dust had settled. Altamont was to be known as Woodstock of the West, spearheaded by the Rolling Stones as a send-off to their tour. Held at an abandoned racetrack in Tracy, California, the event was held only four months after Woodstock. This was a free event trying to capture the same magic that Woodstock had, with much less success. Mick Jagger was especially keen on throwing the festival as soon as possible, as he would benefit the most from finishing the documentary, Gimme Shelter, which was being filmed during that time. The Grateful Dead were heavily involved in promotion and production of the festival, which became ironic as they pulled out just moments before their set. They scouted a band of ragtag hippies to build everything needed for the festival two weeks beforehand. Many people view this incident as hopeless optimism rather than callous negligence. This again led to many amenities not being finished, and what was finished was in shoddy condition. While these mans had determination to throw the festival, most of it was undercut by the lack of a clear figurehead. Without someone to run and check important decisions with, some wicked decisions were bound to happen. One such decision would be the Grateful Dead hiring the Hells Angels as security in exchange for $500 of beer. I'm sure that was something every pot-smoking hippie was itching for, getting mean mugged and harassed by some of the nastiest people on the planet. This obviously put much of the crowd on edge and didn't help when the Angels started having fun. They used pool cues against the crowd, assaulted Marty Ballin, and even killed a man named Meredith Hunter. While many chalked this up to being at the wrong place at the wrong time, the nature behind the attack seems possibly more than coincidental. He was a black man in a sea of white people, wearing a lime green suit to really make him stick out. Hunter was approached by the Hells Angels a few different times, giving his hair pulled or punched in the mouth, and every time he just kept trying to get away. By the end, there were four angels jumping this one guy, and one angel started stabbing Hunter in the back. It was only at this point that Hunter took his gun out. Reportedly, he didn't even try to aim it at anyone, he just held it in the air as a last defense. The angels knocked the gun out of his hand, stabbed him in the neck and kidneys, and left him to die. Two concert goers noticed that Hunter was still alive, so they managed to get him onto the stage in hopes someone would be able to help him. While it's unlikely those two individuals knew, there was a helicopter on standby. However, this was exclusively for the Rolling Stones, even in a life or death matter. Hunter passed away while waiting for an ambulance to arrive. Three other people died while at the event, leaving the name Altamont synonymous with death for years to come. Even with the death and chaos involved, the iconic events featured during the Summer of Love focus on just that. Peace and love. Right around the same time, something much darker was being formed across the pond. In 1968, four individuals, Ozzy Osbourne, Tommy Iommi, Jeezer Butler and Bill Ward formed their first band, Earth. Within a year, they were forced to change their band name, in which they chose the title of their hottest song, Black Sabbath. New songs beyond this point focus on themes of war, social chaos, the supernatural, and the conflict between good and evil. Another large component of the band's success would come from Tommy playing guitar with slacked strings due to losing two fingertips in an industrial accident. With these songs a new musical direction to strive for, the band quickly rose to success. On September 18, 1970, they released the album Paranoid, which included the titular song, 
War Pigs, and Iron Man. This album set the world on fire with heavy metal. While working on production of the album, the band was chased and harassed by a group of skinheads. Surprisingly to this writer in the band, they were able to fight off the aggressors, partly due to Osborne charging in with a hammer. In lieu of the changing tides, Butler gave this statement to Rolling Stones magazine in 1971. It's a satanic world. The devil's more in control now. People can't come together. There's no equality. It's a sin to put yourself above other people, and yet that's what people do. Even with the astounding levels of success the band had found, they were still only paid fractions of what they had earned for years. This was due to their manager Don Arden, Sharon Osborne's father. Sharon had worked under her father, subsequently working for the band at this time. Arden had managed the band from their early days, but never got them signed to his label, Jet Records. He thought this would change in 1979 when Ozzy was kicked out of the band for his drug and alcohol abuse. While Ozzy did get signed to Jet at this time, Sharon swooped in and became Ozzy's manager before Arden had the chance to do so. This allegedly made Arden so furious, he sent his dogs after his own pregnant daughter, resulting in a miscarriage. The Osbournes had left the label in 1982, but still had Arden work as their boss, and he began to pursue litigation against the couple just to be a pain. After Ozzy went on a cocaine and booze bender for three months, Sharon helped him create his new band, Blizzard of Oz, featuring drummer Tommy Aldridge, bassist and lyricist Bob Daisley, pianist Don Airy, and guitarist Randy Rhodes. The band released Mr. Crowley and Crazy Train, launching Ozzy back into the spotlight. While the band was reaching critical acclaim, many were taking notice in the raw talent that Rose exhibited, voted Best New Talent in Guitar Player Magazine and Best Heavy Metal Guitarist in Sounds Magazine in 1981. By 1982, tensions in the band had risen. Osborne was back on the bottle and wanted to do a cover album of Black Sabbath material. Aldridge and Rhodes were seeking a way forward in their careers rather than backwards. At the beginning of that year, Osborne would bite the head off a of bat on stage thinking it was a rubber replica. In later years, he would state in several interviews that it was nothing more than a simple mistake. However, it wouldn't be outside the realm of possibility that Osborne was intoxicated during that time. They would play their last show on the road together on March 18th, 1982. On the way to play at Super Bowl XIV, their bus's AC unit would break, resulting in them stopping at the Calhoun Brothers Tour Bus Company, which had an airstrip with planes and helicopters. During the night, Andrew Aycock, the bus driver and private pilot, took out one of the planes and took tour manager Jake Duncan and Don Airy for a joyride, buzzing close to the tour bus where some of the band was sleeping, in a frivolous effort to wake them up. After landing the plane and promising to take it easy, Acock managed to get Rhodes onto the plane, who had a fear of flying. Acock, in fact, did not take it easy, as he made three passes above the tour bus. On the final pass, he clipped the tour bus, resulting in the plane spinning out and crashing into a pine tree, landing on top of the property's garage and being engulfed in flames. Everyone on board was killed instantly and could only be identified by dental records and adorned jewelry. On April 28, 1988, a complaint was filed against Osborne by Thomas and Myra Waller. They alleged their son had committed suicide due to the music, lyrics, and subliminal messages in Suicide Solution on Blizzard of Oz. The plaintiff's master tape expert was Martin Hall, a Santa Barbara High School graduate who completed upper-level history courses at UC at Santa Barbara, and who had also previously tested tapes for the plaintiffs in a previous court case. He had stated that the alleged subliminal lyrics were rather preconscious in that the vocal performance of the lyrics in question is audible but not immediately intelligible. Due to the heavy lenience on identifying the subject matter as subliminal messages and the plaintiff's own expert proclaiming it to be preconscious suggestions, the judge was forced to rule the case in favor of Osborne. Taking a step back, on January 1st, 1978, the Copyright Law of 1976 became implemented, which formed the basis of copyright law in the U.S. One of the more notable changes this brought was that copyright protection was now granted the moment the work is fixed in a tangible medium. This law also incorporated statutes about fair use, First Amendment provisions, and the life of a copyright. Here it is stated that the creator retains the copyright for their entire life, plus 50 years after their death. Works copyrighted before 1978 would be eligible to receive up to 75 years of protection. The same length of protection would also be granted to anonymous works and work for higher productions. This would change in 1998 with the introduction of the Copyright Term Extension Act. Thanks to effort from politician Newt Gringrich, entertainer and former mayor of Palm Springs, California, 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 Sonny Bono was elected to the 44th district's congressional seat in 1994. 
In 1998, while in C, Bono had laid down the foundation for the Copyright Term Extension Act. He passed away shortly after providing these provisions, and Congress implemented them soon after. Congress gave it the nickname Sonny Bono Copyright Term Extension Act, and most people fondly know it as the Mickey Mouse Law. Disney has been steadily lobbying to change this law since it was changed back in 1978, and has been for decades prior. Since the implementation of the copyright law of 1976, Mickey Mouse was protected by copyright until 2003. If action weren't taken, their beloved mouse would have soon fallen into public domain, meaning anyone could use the character. Billboards, toys, commercials, cartoons, local mom and pop shops, they would have all have been able to use the character, free of charge and without permission. Granted, this only applied to the original Steamboat Mickey iteration of 1928, but this law benefits Disney more than anyone else. The Sonny Bono Act gave authors the ability to protect their copyrights for their entire lives, plus 70 years. For corporations, protections would be granted for 95 years after first publication, or 120 years after creation, whichever expires first. This means that Steamboat Mickey's copyright is set to expire January 1st, 2024, though surely Disney won't give the character up without a fight. There have been several consequences of the copyright law being extended, namely any modern version of Mickey Mouse won't be free to use for decades to come. In fact, all modern works won't be free to use for some time. There's an episode of Adam Ruins Everything that explains this topic. The public domain in the U.S. experienced no new entries for 20 years. This changed in 2019, as works created in 1923 started entering the public domain. The protection of works expanded beyond songs. Books, movies, and scientific papers were among the work locked away behind copyright changes. For example, say there was a hypothetical scientific paper written in 1980 that contained the cure for HIV AIDS, but the author died before they were able to publish it. Instead of being able to take that information and incorporate it into cures moving forward, that information would be forced to lay dormant. If such a paper were to exist, it would be unavailable to the public until 2050. Most people have seen some pop culture reference to artists being divas when it came to specific items in their dressing rooms. This trend spawned from Van Halen, who became infamous in the venue management community for putting in their contract that a bowl of M&Ms with the brown pieces removed must be present in the dressing room. If the band showed up to the venue and noticed their request wasn't fulfilled, they had no moral or legal issue with just leaving. This wasn't due to the superstar's egos being unchecked, but rather a superstar level of attention to detail. If there were brown M&Ms in the bowl, they knew that there was a possibility the venue skipped over other parts of the contract too. When dealing with elaborate lights, flames, and explosions that they were, no one in the band could afford to take a chance on a slacking venue manager. While the 1970s gave rise to heavy metal with Black Sabbath and Van Halen, the 80s saw waves of subgenre bands such as Guns N' Roses and Metallica. The original lineup for Metallica formed in 1981 and consisted of lead singer and rhythm guitarist James Hetfield, drummer Lars Ulrich, lead guitarist Kirk Hammett, and bassist Cliff Burton. The band would quickly find success in speed metal, covering themes of mental health, drug abuse, physical abuse, war and corruption, religion, and the end of days. Everything was going great for the band until they were on tour for their third studio album, Master of Puppets. While outside the outskirts of Stockholm, Sweden, the tour bus rolled on an icy road, ejecting Burton through the window, killing him instantly. The band flew back to San Francisco and hired Jason Newstead to fill the vacancy. Metallica would return in 1988 with And Justice For All, which featured their first Top 40 single, One, which covered anti-war themes. Guns N' Roses came into the public limelight in 1987 with their influential album Appetite for Destruction, featuring tracks such as Welcome to the Jungle, Paradise City, and Sweet Child of Mine. The lineup featured frontman Axl Rose, rhythm guitarist Izzy Strandland, lead guitarist Tracy Guns, bassist Old Bitch, and drummer Rob Gardner. Before making it on stage for their first ever show, Betch was replaced by Duff Rose McCagan. Shortly after, the Guns of Guns N' Roses was replaced by Slash due to an argument, and Gardner was replaced by Steven Adler. Their song One in a Million would spark controversy due to racist and homophobic lyrics. This next section covers a plethora of topics. While they all deserve their own section, for the sake of brevity, it is more important to acknowledge that these events happened and contributed to the spur of the music industry. 
Early 1960s, at the height of his career, Chuck Berry was arrested for transporting a 14-year-old girl across state lines for sex. In 1979, he was arrested for tax evasion, and again in 1990, which resulted in a drug bust on his house. In this seizure, police came across a huge porn stash, some of which featured underage girls. These events led to a report in Spy Magazine detailing his fetishes, including bodily excretions, and how he liked to spy in the women's bathrooms. Also had compilations of women peeing back in a time where footage had to be painstakingly edited together. Marvin Gaye was shot to death by his father in 1984. Madonna released Like a Prayer in 1989, sparking nationwide controversy. Millie Vanilli got exposed of not singing their own songs in late 1990. Rick James committed two separate cocaine-fueled kidnappings in the early 90s. Sinead O'Connor protested the Pope on SNL in 1992. TLC star Lisa Left Eye Lopez burned her boyfriend's house down in 1994. Kurt Cobain's suicide in 1994. R. Kelly marrying a 15-year-old in the mid-90s and recently being placed on trial for CP charges. Tupac being shot in 1996 in Las Vegas and months later Biggie was shot in LA. George Michael was outed as gay after soliciting an undercover officer in 1998. Diddy and Jennifer Lopez were arrested for a shooting but were able to walk in 1999. Woodstock 99. Whitney Houston started dating Bobby Brown and using drugs in the 2000s, which contributed to her death in 2012. Michael Jackson dangled blanket out a window in 2002. Phil Spector, inventor of the Wall of Sound, murdered Lana Clarkson in 2003. Madonna and Britney kissed at the 2003 VMAs. Dixie Chicks bashed Bush in 2003. Janet Jackson's wardrobe malfunction at the 2004 halftime show. Ashley Simpson got caught lip syncing on SNL and walked off stage in 2004. Britney had her breakdown throughout 2006 and 2007. During the occupation of the Middle East, the United States would use songs from artists such as Metallica, Black Sabbath, and Alice Cooper to bombard the enemy's eardrums until they surrendered. Lou Pearlman frauded his band NSYNC and Backstreet Boys and didn't face charges until 2007. Amy Winehouse was shown on video smoking crack in 2007 and died of alcohol poisoning in 2011. Chris Brown assaulted Rihanna in 2009. Kanye had his moment at the 2009 VMAs. Miley Cyrus twerked on Robin Thicke at the 2013 VMAs. ASAP Rocky was arrested for assault charges in Sweden in 2019. 2019 release of Leaving Neverland put evidence against Michael Jackson being a child predator. 2021, Lil Nas X sold 666 satanic sneakers containing a drop of human blood. Kanye's artwork for My Life Was Never Easy sparks controversy early 2022. While some of these actions are more severe than others, they all have had an impact on the industry. Not only does every action set the bar for what hasn't been done before, but also how both creators and consumers view the industry as a whole. Additionally, every individual who watches this will likely think, there are some good topics here, but how could you not talk about blank? A room of 20 students could write about the same topic and have completely unique papers, which is a testament to how pervasive corruption is in the industry. Before discussing the overall point of these writings, there's one more event that must be covered. The music industry, alongside many other industries, took a hit during 2020. After the fallout of COVID-19, fans were eager to get back out into live shows, and artists couldn't be happier to oblige. One such artist would be Travis Scott, as he would hold his third annual Astroworld Festival on November 5th, 2021. As the day went on with other performers building anticipation for Scott, the crowd kept getting larger and larger. Before he made it to the stage, attendees were climbing fences and jumping barriers to escape the growing crowd. Scott hit the stage at 9.06 p.m. with his song Escape Plan, and within minutes, there was a crowd crush. A crowd crush, or crowd surge, happens when there's too many people packed into too dense of an area. The sensation felt inside can be compared to dry drowning, as the immense pressure an individual faces on all sides can make it impossible to breathe. The force exerted during a crowd crush is strong enough to bend steel and inadvertently crush lungs. The average person takes up roughly 10 square feet of space when standing free. When in a tight crowd, that same person gets about 4.5 square feet. During the peak of Astroworld, there was approximately 1.85 square feet per person. By 9.30 p.m., Scott had momentarily paused his show when spotting an ambulance attempting to drive through the crowd, but continued the show just as quickly. At 9.38, there was another surge towards the front of the stage, and the Houston police declared a mass casualty incident. However, promoters and officials of the show deemed it too high a risk to stop the show, 
as stopping could risk a riot. There was one more surge at 10 p.m. when Drake came out on stage. The show would end shortly after, and in the coming days there would be reports of 10 people confirmed dead by compression asphyxia, as well as hundreds more injured. A month after, Scott gave an interview with Charlemagne the God, an influential radio host and TV personality. There, Scott said that he didn't see any signs of distress coming from the crowd as he gave this statement. It's so crazy because I'm that artist too. Anytime you hear something like that, you want to stop the show. You want to make sure fans get the proper attention they need. Anytime I could see anything like that, I did. I stopped it a couple times just to make sure everyone was okay. And I really just go off the fans' energy as a collective, call and response. I just didn't hear that. All the nearly 400 cases against Travis Scott and the Astro World Festival were consolidated into one giant case. This is standard practice in Texas, done as a measure to prevent the court systems from being further backlogged than they already are. While this is standard proceeding and there's nothing that can be done at this point, this could be potentially detrimental to the 2,800 individuals seeking almost a billion dollars in damages. If by some reason the judge deems that there are procedural issues or Fourth Amendment violations, the case could get thrown out. This wouldn't be anything worth noting if the cases were being tried individually. One case being thrown out would just start the next, and there would likely be cases that are clear of potential issues. However, if there's even one instance of these issues, it could easily jeopardize the entire case. A key piece of evidence in the coming months may be the litany of videos littered across social media, showcasing moments from the night. There are multiple videos where it can be heard people are chanting, Stop the show! Another key video is Scott standing on an elevated platform atop the stage, looking down directly at an individual in the crowd being taken out on a stretcher. There were also clips of Scott saying, You know what you came here for alluding to Scott knowing at the very least something was wrong and had no intentions of stopping. At the very worst, he knew by this point people were dying, but either didn't care or wanted it to happen. That, coupled with the fumbled apology that he gave afterwards, shows that at the very least he has no remorse for what happened and holds no personal accountability. There are rumors and allegations of this event being a cult sacrifice. Beneficiaries to such an event could be the Illuminati, the devil, or Kris Jenner, as her birthday was the same night of the show. Speculative reports note the use of occult symbolism in the promotion of the event. Such symbols include the exorbitant usage of stars, the disembodied hands with eyes, circles and portals, individuals walking through doors and becoming demons, and phrases such as open your eyes to a whole new universe and see you on the other side. Another notable comparison made was the entrance to the festival was a giant bust of Travis Scott's head, which bears a level of similarity to the painting Christ in Limbo. Many individuals at the show compared Utopia Mountain, the massive backdrop behind Scott, to opening the gates of hell. The shirt Scott was wearing featured the same imagery of individuals walking through the doors, but the back features a design that most media outlets aren't mentioning. Apple Music recorded the show and uploaded it to YouTube, and around the 10 minute mark, Scott takes his jacket off. At this point, it's hard to see, but on the back of his shirt appears to be a dart pointed at an alien head. Multiple camera angles, such as those featured at 11.54 and 1321, made the design look like the planet Saturn, thanks to the anamorphic nature of the design. While information is sparse at best, one would be inclined to believe that this is an insignia of the cult of Saturn. Speculatively, the cult of Saturn has massive influence on what's successful and what's not. Another known symbol of the cult is giant black cubes, much like the one found outside Rockefeller Hall at SUNY Fredonia. If one were to believe that the cult was involved that night, that same individual would believe the deaths from that night were part of a sacrifice to keep Travis Scott's legacy going. Life goes on for him as he had his first show on March 21st since the travesty. The point of all of this is to say, it's a dangerous game out there. Always has been and always will be. The devil has long had its roots in the industry and people have long taken inspiration from that. While it's unlikely that literal cults and devils are pulling all the strings, if they truly were, would they leave behind any tangible evidence? Regardless, it's a good point of contention. Everyone in the industry has their own demons to face. No one has a perfect life, nor is a perfect person. Some people use their pain and experiences to create beautiful art. Others use it to become powerful and influential figureheads. For anyone wanting to climb the industry ladder, they now must first use it to educate themselves. Anyone with the right style and sound can get a record deal, but unless the artist is educated enough to defend and work for themselves, 
they're likely going to regret signing the dotted line. Beyond that, it is arguable that an artist has a moral obligation to educate themselves. No longer exist the days an artist can feign ignorance. From signing a bad deal, to being responsible for the preventable deaths of concert goers, and everything in between, artists must accept that their actions, good or bad, have consequences. Not only for the artist, but for the fans that support that artist as well. That's not to say nothing bad is going to happen moving forward. Everything learned from the past simply points to that not being true. However, the more educated an individual is, the less likely they are to make a detrimental decision. The more educated individuals occupy an industry, the more power the industry has to change. Knowledge becomes evil if the aim be not virtuous. Stay ignorant.